Okay, as, um, as a friend of mine, Albert Tate says all the time, it's time for a message, and here's how he would put it. I feel the same way. I got a lot of fish to fry and a short time to cook them. So you all ready? Okay, <laughs> grab your message outline out. You all ready for a message? Okay, grab your message outline out. Grab your Bible, turn to Galatians chapter five. And while you're doing that, I want to tell you a quick story. Actually, I want to show you a picture. Okay, check this out. Okay, that is, I was a poverty-stricken youth pastor 35 years ago, and I bought the cheapest car I could find, which turned out to be an old Mustang convertible. I've never bought a car this cheap. And I have had that car for 37 years, people, okay? And it has been a blast. I mean, my kids love it. I love it. Matter of fact, this picture was taken last year. Carol and I's birthdays are in February. And so our kids awesome. They hired a photographer, Southern California. We went down and we took our family picture um, it, with the Mustang, okay? And then here's another shot of the Mustang. That's Carol and I just in it. It's a really cool car. It's a 65 Mustang convertible, 289, automatic transfer. I, I, I gotta move on. Um, the, I love the car. Our whole family does. It's a blast, okay? Um, the reason I'm telling that story is this. I had a problem with it one time. I'm in Southern California, I've got to get to a meeting and I get in the Mustang and I go, man, I am late, but I got to get there because I'm leading the meeting, okay? So I turn the thing, nothing. Turn the key, nothing. Raise your hand if this has ever happened to you. Your car has a sensor in it. You're late, it's important, and it won't work, okay? So I turn it, turn it, turn it. I'm going, oh no, dead battery. I open the door, but the lights underneath come on. So I go, I don't think it's the battery. The problem is I'm the least mechanical person you've ever met in your life. I can break stuff, I just can't fix it. Okay, and so I go and I open up the hood like all guys do. And I'm looking in there like, I don't have a clue what I'm looking at, but maybe if I look long enough, it'll fix itself or something. So I'm looking around, I'm going, I got new clue what's going on. I know the battery's hooked up. So I'm thinking it must be the start or something like that. So I close it and I go, I shut the hood extra hard to shake something up so now it'll work. So, you know, so I get in the thing and I turn the key, nothing. And I go, oh, this is insane. This stupid car is broken. I can't fix this car, and so I'm going to miss this, all this kind of stuff. And then I'm sitting here, and I'm going, wait a second. I reach down, I put it in park, start the car, go to the meeting. <laughs> it's embarrassing to tell you all this, people. I am in this car, and I'm sitting here going, this stupid car is broken. Something's wrong with this dumb car, okay? And the problem wasn't the car. The problem was, yeah, thanks a lot, me, okay? And now, by the way, I, here's what I want to say is, that is very good news because if the problem were the car, I can't fix it. If the problem is me, that can get fixed and then anything's possible and you can get where you're supposed to be. Make sense? Okay. Now, that's good news. We are in a series about the fruit of the Spirit and underneath all of this is this. I got good news for you. Your problem is not God. Your problem is not the Bible, which is a good thing. If your problem with God, you ain't fixing him. The Bible's, you're gonna let you fix it. When your source of all your problems is yourself, anything can get fixed and then you can get on and live the life and go to where God wants you to go. Make sense? This is the best prescription ever for where to go and how to get fixed, okay? And it all starts with this verse. So I want you to get into this thing. This is awesome. You ready? It's Galatians, one of the most important verses in the entire Bible. It says this, the fruit of of the Spirit. Circle the word fruit. Notice it. It's going to give you nine, but it doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. It says the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. We'll come back to that. He says the fruit of the Spirit is... Now, I'm going to read these things slow. Y'all ready? Just sink this in. Wouldn't it be great to have homes like this? Wouldn't it be great to have a country like this? Wouldn't it be great to be a person like this? Check it out. The fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are God's nine values to discover. Let me put it this way. Just look at it for a second, okay? 
Those nine things are what every single person wants in the home they live in. They want love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness. You know, that's what they want, okay? By the way, I'm a dad. Those nine things are what my kids want in a dad. I'm now a grandfather. Those nine things are gonna build a great relationship. You, matter of fact, you're going, hey man, I'm a parent now. I need to read 75 parenting books. That's a good idea. However, if these nine things don't describe you in your parenting, you got no future. Make sense? No matter what, these nine, these nine things are what our country needs. I got, I got four kids and grandkids now. In fact, one of my daughters, I think, is right over there somewhere. Um, these are the not, these are the nine things, these are the only nine things that matter to my kids. You know, is dad loving? Does he care about me or is he apathetic? Okay. Joy, does dad bring joy into my life or is he a downer? All of this stuff. And as a matter of fact, I can prove it, okay? We have these family affirmation times when there's a birthday or something like that. We affirm whoever it is. And sometimes it's my birthday, so I get affirmed. None of my kids have ever said, Dad, last year you helped rescue Willow Creek. They got a new pastor. Great job. What I appreciate about you is what you helped make happen in Chicago. Never came up, okay? Same thing. Southern California church called Southwest Church. Same thing down there. Never comes up. I've written a ton of books. A ton of books. Not one time has any of my kids ever said, chapter seven was awesome. <laughs> Matter of fact, watch this. Raise your hand if you've read one of my books. There can be a whole bunch of in there. Okay, good. My kids haven't. Not one. Not one. I've never even seen them with my book. Okay, I've autographed thousands. None of my kids have ever said, dad, man, could you just autograph this for me? They don't care about four things that everybody thinks matters most. Write these in. Because most people are going to go, I want to change my life, okay? And people change their life, and they think these four things are the things that matter in America, okay? And here they are. Appearance, approval of other people, peer pressure when you're in junior high, high school, or beyond, okay? Achievement, like, oh, if I'm a big shot, if I've written, blah, blah, blah. Or affluence, like my network and myself. Or Matter of fact, just pick a couple of these things. A lot of people are going, Man, what matters most to me, honestly, is appearance. Most people I know, matter of fact, would anybody here like to lose some weight this year? Yeah, if you grill down deep, most people are going, the real reason I want to lose weight isn't so I'll feel better, it's so I'll look better. Come on. Problem is, I got a truth. I got, here's a bad news truth. You know what it is? Here it is. Your appearance doesn't last. <laughs> eventually, eventually, sorry, all your appearance will eventually go downhill. Sorry. The, um, matter of fact, watch this. How many of you, show of hands, how many of you are like living proof that appearance goes downhill? <laughs> how many of you going, no, I'm actually doing pretty well, but my mom and dad, man, they are living proof. Put your hand down, Leslie. The, um, um, the, um, matter of fact, there is an app out now that none of you have ever used. You know what it is? It's an aging app. Put your picture in, fast forward 10 years, and it shows you your downhill self. So I decided to try it. Here's Andrew McCourt. And if he goes really downhill over 10 years, here it is. The, um, just kidding, Kurt. The, um, now, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And the promise is people are going, I want those things in my life. These are really big deal, okay? Why do people want them in their life? Um, Raymond, let's show a chart of the opposite. We actually, Kevin Thompson, a brilliant job putting this chart together. Instead of love, hate. Instead of joy in your life and in your home and your relationships, despair. Instead of peace, racked with anxiety. Instead of patience, demanding. Instead of kindness, meanness. Instead of goodness, corruption. Instead of faithfulness, faithlessness, gentleness, harshness, self-control, chaos. God is so smart, people. The list on the left is what God wants for you, and the list on your right is what culture will drive into you, and I can prove it. Which one of those lists looks more like America now? No question. 
Hate's on the rise. Despair is on the rise. Anxiety's broken every record. People are more demanding, mean, cor that, any corruption? Good Lord. Faith, hearts is complete chaos. And you just look at this and go, is there a better way? Now, look up here. The Bible says it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit, which means it, something's growing in my life. So this whole message, I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna do it really fast. This whole, matter of fact, I'm gonna do it in like 13 minutes. This whole message, I'm gonna unpack is this. How do you get the right stuff growing in your life and how do you get the wrong stuff growing out of your life? The most important question you will ever ask if you care about your future. And Galatians answers it all brilliantly. Check it out. The apostle Paul starts with this. Y'all still with me? Yes. He says, so I say, here's the key. Walk by the Spirit. Circle that phrase. What's that mean? I'll give you a definition of that. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. flesh. Circle flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So what, is, what does all this mean? Like flesh, Spirit, what does it mean? What's Paul saying? Here's what he's saying. There's two roads and here's the roads. Flesh and Spirit, or here, better way to put it, flesh is a life without God. Write it in. Spirit is a life in Christ. I got a choice. I can have a life without God or I can have a life in Christ. Now, which means at some point there is a fork on the road and I've got to choose one. So what if I go, what if I go left and I go, I'm going to choose a life without God, okay? Paul then says, here's what life looks like without God. It's a crossroad choice. A life without God, he says this, and these, I'm going to read it straight off the screen with you. The acts of the flesh are obvious, and then he launches this list, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, richcraft, hatred, discord. Any discord in our country today? And he says this, jealousy, fits of rage. In my Bible, I wrote in road rage. Anybody ever had that? Fits of rage, okay, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God because they have a life without God. Now, now, this verse, I just read this to you and you go, that's a whole bunch of negative things. Some of you go, that just described my family. I grew up in, you know, the, if I, this verse is genius if you'll take a deeper look at it. So look at the screen, okay? Here's the same verse, but here there are these words break into four destructive categories. First, he says this, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, that's sexual abuse. Is that rampant in our culture? And celebrated by our media, okay? Then he says this, and then he gets on to two others. He goes, not only is it that, he says, here's the second category, idolatry and witchcraft, that's spiritual abuse, okay? Then notice the longest list, eight things about one theme. He goes, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. That's relational abuse. And then he goes on and says, and drunkenness, orgies, and the like. That's substance abuse. Let me ask you a question. Is there any sexual abuse, spiritual abuse, relational abuse, and substance abuse going on in our country and our culture? Yeah, and he's literally going, and here's the problem is, he is saying, if you choose a life without God, you will pursue one of these four things. And when you start pursuing one of them, you will be taken over by all of them. And it is not the life you want. Make sense? Okay. And, the, and when you're looking at this stuff, you're going, wait a second. Um, the Bible's so negative. Look at all this list of don'ts. Okay. I grew up in Southern California. There's a freeway in Southern California, the 10 freeway, runs through a city called Pomona. There was a lady, tragically, her son was right on the, her, her son who played in the backyard all the time and their backyard was right on the freeway. There was a fence there and every day when her son went to the place, she said, don't climb the fence. Don't climb the fence. But a year and a half into this, this kid obviously thought, well, mom's just, you know, trying to keep me from having fun. So he climbed the fence and went out onto the freeway and the CHP reported he was run over by nine cars before his lifeless body rolled off the freeway. And, and I'm sure he thought, oh, this fence here is restricting my enjoyment of life. That fence, every single 
thing in the Bible that is a warning or every negative command in the Bible is there to protect you and to provide for you and to give you a great future. Every single thing. And so he starts by laying this whole list out, okay? And then, then that's a life without God. So then you go, is there a better way? Yeah, glad you asked. And he says, here's the better way. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gent faithfulness, gentleness, self control Now that also breaks into three great areas. I put the slide up on the thing. The first three are spiritual health. You and God are in good shape. The second three are relational health. You and the people that you connect with are in great shape. And the third one is emotional health, which means you, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, you're an emotionally healthy person. Those are the things everybody wants. By the way, I can prove to you those are the things that everybody wants no matter what the circumstances are, okay? Um, Carol and I um, have kids. Uh, the, um, uh, some of them are married, they have kids. And our son, Mark, married a gal named Gia who is spectacular. Spectacular. That if we always go, she's the closest thing we've ever seen to my wife Carol. She's just spectacular. Okay, and so they live in a little tiny home in Sacramento. And when their grandson RJ was born, um, they sort of were like, "We don't have space, so we're going to have to remodel this home and sort of create more space in here." So they called and said, they met with us and said, "Hey, we're going to be out of our home for a few months. Um, can we live with you guys?" And we said, absolutely. They said, can we move in with you? We said, well, move in in the Greek means totally take over every square inch of the house. All, every bedroom except ours, the li both living rooms, take over the entire house with, at that point, our three-month-old grandson. But it was only going to be a couple months. Anybody notice construction slowed down a little? Okay. So it's been a year, probably a little bit over a year, and it has been a blast. It is, I choked up talking about it. It has been so fun. We've gotten to hang out with our grandson his first year of life. We've gotten to hang out with them. We have had more fun. We have had a blast. And then, and it's funny, their house is getting fixed now and I'm kind of bummed they're moving out because we've had such a good time. Matter of fact, I'm thinking about like flooding their house or something and we'll do something. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that publicly. Um, the and I started thinking, why has this been so much fun? Because it could have been so chaotic. And the reason it's been so much fun is, to be really honest with you, Mark and I are a couple of idiots. Or, as our speaker Wednesday night, Mark Clark would call us morons, because you're a guy. And, but our wives look like the nine things in the fruit of the Spirit. Our, their love, joy, peace. This is a description of both of them. This is the home everybody wants. It's the friend everybody wants. It's the atmosphere everybody wants. It makes chaos enjoyable. Make sense? And so the question is this, how do I get the right, how do I become that person? How do I get the right stuff growing in my life? Okay, holy smokes. Glad you asked. I want to give you the three most important questions you will ever ask. Keep these notes for a long time. Here we go. Number one. Question number one is this. If I want the fruits of the Spirit, first thing I got to ask is, am I a Christian? Am I a Christian? Now, the problem is this. Christian in America means nothing, okay? Like, I'm a Christian. I'm an American, okay? I'm a Christian. I live in Texas or Tennessee, you know? They... Or I'm a Christian, I go to church. You can, sitting in a church does not make you a Christian. You can sit in a donut shop, it will not make you a donut. You can, you can sit in a garage, it will not make you a car. The, um, or, well, I'm a Christian, I was baptized as a baby. That does not make you a Christian, okay? Or I'm a Christian, don't assume just because you came forward at a camp when you were seven, you're a Christian, okay? Or don't assume just because your Christian grandmother said, I'll give you a cookie if you ask Jesus into your heart, that you are a Christian, which is what Christian grandmothers should do. The, um, um, so the question is, how do you know that you know you're a Christian? Glad you asked. Let's just take it from the Bible. How about that? Circle two words. Yet to all, and by the way, all means you. Yet to all who did receive him. Circle the word receive. 
And who do you receive? Christ. To all who received him, to those who believed, circle believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And the Bible says this. How do you become a Christian? When you, when you say, Jesus, I'm going to take whatever level of small faith I have and put it in you and receive you into my life. The second you receive Christ, you receive eternal life. You are completely forgiven now and forever. Your entire life changes. You get the presence of promises of God in your life because you have received Christ, which means he's either on the inside or he's nowhere at all, okay? What does it mean to be a Christian? Here it is, believe and receive, okay? Now, question number one is this, am I a Christian? The problem is this, a lot of people are going, I'm a Christian, but I haven't changed. I haven't. Nothing great's going on in my life. Why? Because that's just the first step. There's a second question, and here it is. Am I connected to God? Am I connected to God? That's abiding. He says, that, so I say, walk by the Spirit. So I, so I, I, I receive Christ, and then I stay connected to him and close to him and abiding in him. Why is this so important? Okay? I had a really cool thing happen about a week and a half ago. Um, the, there's a news outlet called Deseret News. It's kind of a nationwide thing. And they contacted the office and said, we'd like to interview Ray about goal setting, which is, and it's for a thing that's not a Christian deal. I went, sure. So we set up a Zoom call and they interviewed three leaders from across the country and I was one of them. And they said, and they said we just want to talk about goal setting and having a better future. And they said, so they said, like, what advice do you have for people setting goals? And I said, I said, create the condition for which it will work. And they said, what do you mean by that? And I said, here's my opinion. If you, here's how life works, okay? The confidence, being actually confident is huge because if you're confident, then you have hope. And when you have hope, then you can set goals and have a future because nobody can dream about their future until they have confidence and hope. Confidence and hope are the foundation. So anybody trying to set goals for this new year that doesn't have a foundation of confidence and hope is going to be frustrated and not have a good year. And they said, and I said, matter of fact, my life, my life verse, read it and memorize it, people, Philippians 1.6. Paul says, I am confident of this very thing. God, who began a good work in you, will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. Almost every book I've ever autographed, except for my kids, that I write that phrase in, okay? The, um, in this, the I am confident, you know, and, and then this is the best setup of all time by a publication. They said, well, how do you advise people get confidence? Yes, they asked. So I said, here's what I do, okay? You, I said, everybody needs a source of confidence and you're either going to get it from culture or you're going to get it from Christ. You're either going to get it from politics and politicians or you're going to get it from the promises of God. So I said, every morning, I do not get out of bed without reading a devotional. So I start my day and my focus is on the promises of God instead of the problems in the world. Your future is going to be determined not by your circumstances. Your future is going to be determined by are you focused on problems or the promises of God? Because people that focus on problems go downhill, get negative and toxic and have no future. People that are focused on the promises of God, which are still legit and still work, and you'll hear about them all through the Bible conference. When people are focused on the promises of God, that creates confidence, which creates hope, which creates goals, which creates a whole better future. That makes sense? The, um, it was so fun to say that, okay? Now, why is this a big deal, okay? Because he says this, walk by the Spirit. Now, look up here for a second, okay? Here's where he says, but the fruit, singular. All these things, you don't create them. You create conditions where they grow in your life. Which means this, if we had the most expensive fruit tree in the world in here and we uprooted it and we put it in toxic soil, what would happen to that fruit tree? It would stop producing fruit and it would die. Would you agree? Or if we took an unhealthy fruit tree and we moved it and we planted it in really good soil and we watered it and fed it, what would happen? It would grow and thrive. 
Folks, the most important thing about you, your future, your marriage, your future and everything, your emotional health, your relational health, your spirit, the most important thing about you, you want to create conditions where the right stuff grows in your life and the wrong stuff gets good. Quit focusing on that. Get yourself in good soil. You will grow. Okay? It's massive, okay? And the, uh, which is, by the way, that's why commercial for the Bible conference on point two is this. We have created conditions every single night for you to get in really good soil. I promise you, you give God five nights, you get in good soil, and you water that stuff, and you feed your faith, and the future will be unbelievable, okay? And so some of you are going, well, you know what? I go on Sunday morning, but I don't do anything else. Break a pattern and see what happens. Okay. Oh, I got to keep moving. Okay. Number one, am I a Christian? Number two, am I connected with God? Holy smokes. And number three is this, am I listening to the right voices? Am I listening to the right voices? So he says, I tell you this and insist on it, Lord, that you no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility they're thinking. And then this is awesome. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is corrupted by deceitful desires and be made new in the attitude of your minds and put on the new self. Here's what he's saying. Take the old self, put it off. Take the new self and put it on. Some of you are going, how? Glad you asked. People don't see this in this verse. There's a bridge. And he says, be made new in the attitude of your minds. If you're taking notes, write this down. Be very careful the voices you listen to. I want to wrap this up by showing you a famous commercial. This has been seen by millions of people on YouTube. In the afternoon, it was an old Duracell battery commercial, but it happened, a guy named Derek Coleman, who wanted to be a professional football player, grew up deaf. You'll actually hear it if you pay careful attention in the way he says words. You could tell he couldn't hear when he was growing up. And, um, And he had an experience happen to him And I want you to listen carefully what he says about listening to voices. This commercial aired the week he played in the Super Bowl for the Seattle Seahawks. Check this out. They told me it couldn't be done, but I was the lost call. I was picked on and picked last. Coach didn't know how to talk to me. They gave up on me. Told me I should just quit. Don't move until I move. Don't move until I move. And the last pick is... They didn't call my name. Told me it was over. But I've been deaf since I was three. So I didn't listen. And now I'm here with a lot of fans in the NFL cheering me on. And I can hear them all. 